Hello, true crimers. What the fudge was that? I don't know. Anyway, hello, how are you? Whatever. Uh, this is going to be another compilation video of things, videos from my Tiki Talkie page, UAG. No. Yes. No. Yeah. This is going to be my series that I have over there called Still Unsolved Mysteries. I talk about so much true crime. I think I'm going to get murdered when I walk out of my stupid house. Someone's going to stab me in the left ear and it's going to be a mystery forever. Does anyone else have that problem? Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -boo. Well, that was depressing. Anyway, let me depress you some more. This is going to be like well over 20 videos of a whole bunch of crimes, unfortunately, that have not been solved. But perhaps someone watching this compilation video knows the answer to one of these cases. Because after all, somebody somewhere out there knows something. Perhaps that someone is you. I've always tried to do Robert Stack's voice, but I just can't do it. No one could do his voice. He is the master of his voice. Pro probably because he was the one to own it, because it was his... I'm very uh, awkward and cringy. I should probably just let the video start. Uh, anyway, uh, of course, as usual, these are all in TikTok format. So a lot of y'all hate that. A lot of y'all don't care. I, it's okay if you don't want to watch it because of that. Or you can just flip your phone over and uh, put my face on your pillow uh, and uh, just listen to my stupid voice tell these stories. You know? Maybe you could do that. Or don't. It's fine. It's whatever. Anyway, this is too long. I'm going away now. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> no. Hello, true crimers. I wanted to give you just a quick little introductory video to a new series I'm starting today. And it is called Still Unsolved Mysteries, where I will be pulling cases directly from the show Unsolved Mysteries that are still unsolved, and we'll talk about them. So, join me on this new series, and perhaps you can help solve a mystery. <laughs> That was the best Robert Stack I could do, and that's all you get. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. What if I did it like this? Oh my god, that is horrifying. <laughs> Join me and help solve a mystery. <laughs> oh shit. Rest in peace, Robert. Rest in peace, baby. Hello, true crimers. You'll never get Robert Stack down, Mike. Just stop. It's time for the first episode of Still Unsolved Mysteries. This is the disappearance of Diane Shawcroft and Jennifer Luth. Their story was featured on Season 12, Episode 3 of Unsolved Mysteries. Diane was 20 years old and Jennifer was 19, and they were actually friends who originally lived in Colorado. But in 1996, the two of them would actually just pick up and move to Arizona because that's where Diane's sister lived. So at the time of this case, they were living in Glendale, Arizona. Now, allegedly, Diane got into a little fight with her sister, Christina. So she, along with Jennifer, stormed out of the house. They were going to go to the store, blow off some steam, and Diane said to her sister, we'll be right back. Around 7 p.m., and this is an image from the show, they got to a mini-mart that was a few blocks down the road from their house. The time frame that they were in the mini-mart, they actually got from the cashier, and he was there all night. So after the girls were done purchasing their stuff, they actually walked outside and sat down on a bench. And for whatever reason, they just sat out there for a couple of hours, talking and, you know, I guess maybe they just wanted some extra time to blow off the argument they had. The cashier claims he saw a blue truck, again, this is from the show, um, pull up and the man inside said something to the two girls and the cashier said the two girls got into the blue truck. They drove off and that was it. No one would ever see them alive again. A few months later, some hunters were out in a desolate location and this was near Cortez Junction. They would stumble across two bodies. 
It was the bodies of Diane Shawcroft and Jennifer Luth, and they were literally laying on top of each other. The police never revealed their cause of death other than saying that it was a homicide. This is the exact location where the bodies were dumped, and they left a little memorial there for them. Several months later, um, someone would come by and take the pictures out of the frame. The thing about that is the only people who knew about the exact location the bodies were were the family, the police, and obviously the killer. So was he coming back, or...? Police believe this is someone who knows the area well. This was 100 miles away from the Phoenix area where the girls lived. And it was 15 to 20 miles off of a highway. <sighs> this is the composite drawing of the man the cashier saw. And this is a composite of the truck he was driving. This happened on May 26th, 1996. So viewers, perhaps you can help solve the mystery. Hello, true crimeers. It's time for another episode of Still Unsolved Mysteries. The case I'm about to talk about, which this is a screenshot from, originally aired in Season 11, Episode 2. Available to watch on YouTube. And this is the case of Curtis Pichon. Fewer discretion is advised. Curtis here was born on July 11th, 1959. And at the time of this case, he was living in Seabrook, New Hampshire. Now, Curtis was a police officer for the Concord Police Department, but unfortunately, he had to cut his career short. And this was because he developed multiple sclerosis. And because of that, he was no longer able to fire his weapon, so he had to move on. This hit him pretty hard mentally. He absolutely loved being a police officer. His family would say that Kurt fell into a depression and unfortunately turned to alcohol. Kurt would bounce around from job to job, but he finally landed on something he enjoyed. He would end up working at Venture Corporation, and I guess there they made automobile parts. And he got a job there as a security guard, something that would, you know, kind of bring him back to his roots as a cop. There was also no requirement for their security guards to carry a weapon. So it, this was basically ideal for him. On July 5th, 2000, Kurt would get to work around 9.30 p.m. And at 1.42 a.m., he would call 911. And this was because his vehicle, which was parked in the area, had suddenly caught on fire. They were obviously able to put out the fire, but this is the damage that it caused. Police and firefighters who were observing Kurt said he seemed kind of just calm about this, like it didn't seem to bother him at all. Now, firefighters did find evidence that Kurt, in fact, did try to put the fire out with an extinguisher, but at one point the investigators thought maybe he had done this to his own vehicle, but they ruled there was no sign of arson. They actually couldn't figure out how the fire started at all. By 2 a.m., Kurt had just gone back to work. He wrote in the logbook that there was the fire, and then two and a half hours later, when Kurt's supervisor went to check on him, Kurt was gone. He was nowhere to be found. They searched the entire factory. They searched all of the surrounding area. Nowhere. Kurt's family said that a few days prior to this disappearance, he did purchase a 9mm handgun. So a self-unaliving was possible. But then several days later, they actually found that weapon still wrapped up in his home. Kurt had also told his family he felt unsafe at work, but for reasons unknown. His family does believe that he is dead. But how, why, and where is he? She vanished and then showed up 642 miles away. Hello, true crimeers. It's time for another episode of Still Unsolved Mysteries. Viewer discretion is advised. This was Judy Smith, and her episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired in Season 12, Episode 11. In December of 1996, Judy had married her longtime boyfriend, Jeff Smith. In April of 1997, the couple would plan to travel to Philadelphia for a weekend because Jeff had a pharmaceutical conference to go to. Now, when they arrived to Boston's Logan International Airport on April 9th, Judy realized she forgot her ID. So, Jeff flew to Philadelphia on his own, and then Judy would take a separate flight to Philadelphia after she got her ID. And by all accounts, that's exactly what happened. 
On April 10th, Jeff's pharmaceutical conference was starting, and Judy was planning to go sightseeing. And again, by all accounts, she did so. Judy threw on her signature red backpack, and she began to explore around Philadelphia. And then the plan was for Judy and Jeff to meet up later that night and go to dinner. But when Jeff's conference was done and he went back to the hotel room, Judy wasn't there. So Jeff began retracing the route that Judy was supposed to take that day. He couldn't find her. Jeff would contact Judy's daughter from another marriage, ask her if she heard anything from Judy. She said no. Jeff contacted the Philadelphia police and they said, Listen, she hasn't been missing very long. We can't do anything about this. There were many, many supposed accounts of people seeing Judy throughout Philadelphia in the ensuing days. But none of those witness testimonies came to any kind of actual answers. People claimed she appeared to be disoriented. Some people spotted her in New Jersey. Jeff was considered a suspect, but there were just way too many witnesses and his alibi was incredibly good. And then, on September 7th, 1997, deep in the woods of Asheville, North Carolina, 642 miles away from where Judy was last seen, skeletal remains were found. Dental records would quickly confirm they were the remains of Judy Smith. Her signature red backpack was not with her, but there was a purse next to her body, but it was not hers. They found expensive sunglasses, Again, not hers. She had been stabbed to death. She was dressed in hiking gear, and her family did say she did like to hike. They said at that point Jeff was completely cleared because he was morbidly obese and couldn't get her to where she was. A suspected serial killer, Gary Hilton, was considered, but that didn't pan out. How did she get there? Who murdered her? Oh, overshot my landing there. Okay, hello, Drew Crimers. It's time for another episode of Still Unsolved Mysteries. Viewer discretion is advised. This case originally aired on Unsolved Mysteries on August 12th, 2002. And this is Opal Zacharias. That is a really cool name. On March 6th, 1987, around 8 o'clock in the morning, Opal was just finishing up breakfast and getting ready for work. She would enter her garage. Her husband was still inside the house when all of a sudden, two men ran into the garage and attacked Opal. The two men were fighting with Opal when all of a sudden, one of their guns went off and Opal was shot. She did not die from the gunshot wound, however. As she was on the ground in pain, the two men jumped into her vehicle with her keys, backed up and ran her over. They then dragged her body down the driveway and then they left her sitting in the middle of the road. These are her glasses that came off of her and they were broken. Her cause of death was being crushed by the vehicle. Now this all happened in a very, very short amount of time. It was very fast. Her husband had almost no time to react. By the time he got outside, his wife was already dying in the middle of the road. One of the attackers drove off in the vehicle while the other one fled on foot, and they were seen hopping over a fence. Now, witnesses got a pretty good look at them. Several tips came in to say that one of the men was 31-year-old Dang M. Lee, whose picture I cannot find. At one point, he was actually arrested. I can't find out if that arrest was related to this event, but regardless, he was released for unknown reasons. His fingerprints, however, because they have those on record, were in the garage. Her car was found a few... What are you guys doing? I don't think you're going to find him under the car. Anyway, her car was found a few days later. Dang Lee's fingerprints were in the car. Now, several other tips came in about the other man, who looks like a Matthew McConaughey and Christopher Walken if you match their heads together, Lance Bedgood. He's allegedly the guy who shot her but he has never been caught. This is an age progression of what he would look like, but he would be in his 70s at this point. By the way, I'm sorry, this happened in Houston, Texas, but both men are still at large, which makes this case still unsolved. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another 
Christmas murder mystery. And it's also a still unsolved? Ding! Festive! This is the case of Latricia White. Viewer discretion is advised. Latricia lived in this home in Lockhart, Texas. She lived there with her boyfriend. I'll be right back, sir. Okay. Yeah. There we go, we're twins. She lived with her boyfriend, Dub Wackerhagen. Uh-huh. Dub's son, Chance Wackerhagen, also lived with her. On December 27th, 1993, Latricia's father would go to the house to see if she was home because no one had heard from her in a couple of days. When no one answered the door, he then went inside, where he discovered the body of his daughter. Latricia White had been shot six times, but there was no signs of forced entry. There was no sign of a fight in the house. Nothing appeared to have been stolen. The only things that were missing from the house was Dub and Chance. Ah, I'm done with these. My eyes look like Tron. Now, Dub's family believed that Chance and Dub were also killed, but the authorities believed that Dub was possibly the killer. He then took Chance and fled. Dub was known to be a very jealous man. He wouldn't let Latricia talk to anyone. He always needed to know where she was. So they got into fights. They got into a big fight three days before the murder, but then Dub came back. And on the day he came back is the same day that Latricia was killed. Three days after Latricia was killed, in Austin, Texas, about 30 miles away, they found Dub's abandoned pickup truck. By the way, this is a scene from Unsolved Mysteries. This is not an actual crime scene photo. In the truck, they found a hunting rifle. They found his wallet. They found his checkbook. In the bed of the truck, there were Christmas presents that were wrapped but they had blood all over them. Blood that did not match Latricia, and it was inconclusive in terms of matching Chance or Dub. And even though he was missing, Dub was formally charged with murder. But Dub, who this is what he would probably look like today, and Chance, same thing, age progression, have both never been seen again. Not a whisper, nothing. In 2016, they reopened the case. All police have said is that they found evidence that Chance and Dub also met with foul play, likely. And now her ex-husband is the new main suspect. But officially, this is still unsolved. zippity doo -da, zippity a, my oh my. I am gay, I don't have a rhyme, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, true crimers. It's time for another still unsolved mysteries. And this is the case of the Zip Gun Bomber. See what I did there at the beginning? Yeah, okay. Viewer discretion is advised. This case originally aired on January 3rd, 1997. This is Joan Betty Kipp, and she was from Brooklyn, New York. And on May 7th, 1982, she received a package, and inside the package was a cookbook. It wasn't something she ordered, and it wasn't something she was expecting to get. She assumed someone had just sent her an early Mother's Day gift. When she opened the cookbook, pictured here, she was shot. Three bullets came out of what appeared to be some sort of gun, and they went in three different directions. You see, the book had a hollowed out section, and inside was a zip gun, which I can't completely show you here, you know? It's essentially a crudely made, like, homemade gun. Joan was rushed from her home to the hospital, but unfortunately, she would succumb to the wounds and she died. Now, at one point, Joan's husband was considered a suspect, but ultimately, police narrowed in on her 28-year-old son, Craig. The handwriting that was on the package apparently somewhat kind of matched his handwriting. And then bomb-sniffing dogs detected his scent on the package, but ultimately, they ended up dropping the charges because they had nothing concrete. 11 years later... It happened again. On October 15th, 1993, a man by the name of Anthony Lenza was in Pennsylvania on vacation with his wife. His adult children would come to visit them in Pennsylvania and they brought the mail with them. One of the pieces of mail was a package and when he opened it, it had a little medallion in it. But when he opened the package, three gunshots went off. Anthony and two of his family members were shot. 
Thankfully, none of them died. April 5th, 1994, a 75-year-old Brooklyn woman named Alice Caswell, she got a package that was also a medallion. And again, when she opened it, three gunshots went off, she was shot. The package was actually addressed to her brother. Thankfully, she survived. June 27th, 1995, an 18-year-old pregnant woman named Stephanie Gaffney who lived in Queens, she got a package that contained a book. She opened it, and inside was another zip gun. Because of the way she was holding it, the bullets didn't even hit her, or her baby. June 20th, 1996, 77 Brooklyn retiree Richard Bazile, he got a package with a video cassette. It shot him. He survived. Luckily, there was only ever one fatality, but they never had any valid suspects. It was random, and it's still unsolved. This is by far one of the strangest still unsolved mysteries. Hello, true crimers. This is the bizarre story of Blair Adams. Viewer discretion is advised. This story first aired on Unsolved Mysteries on April 18th, 1997. Now, he went by Blair Adams, but his full name was Robert Dennis Blair Adams. And he was born and raised in British Columbia, Canada. And nothing seemed to be too unusual about his life until July 5th, 1996. On that day in British Columbia, he took out all of his money. He had a safety deposit box that had like gold and jewelry in it. He took all of that out. The next day, he goes to the Canadian border and he attempted to cross over into the United States, but because of all of the cash and the unusual things he had on him, the border patrol suspected that he was some sort of drug trafficker, so they denied him entry. So he said, okay, went back to British Columbia and went to work the next day. Oh, he went there to quit his job. He then spends $1,600 on a plane ticket to Germany. He then goes to a friend's house in Canada and says, someone is trying to kill me. So that is why he's trying to leave the country, but he never said who, he never said why, he never elaborated on this whole kill plot. Then on July 9th, he trades his ticket to Germany back in. He rents a car, and this time he's able to travel into Seattle without any issues. He then buys a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C. When he gets to Washington, D.C., he then rents this white Toyota, then drives to Knoxville, Tennessee. By the way, he knows almost no one in the United States. He especially has no connections to anyone in D.C. or Tennessee. Around 5.30 p.m. on July 10th, he gets to a gas station. He tells the gas station attendant, my car won't start. The attendant says, well, you have the wrong key for the car. A mechanic then picks him up and takes him to Fairfield Inn, where he goes in the lobby. This is the exact footage. He paces back and forth, goes in and out of the uh, lobby. He gets his room, and then 12 hours later, he is found dead in the parking lot of that hotel. This is a clip from the show, by the way, not the real thing. Blair was naked from the waist down. Next to his body was his fanny pack, the now correct key to his rental car. His pants were next to him, turned inside out. Thousands of dollars in cash and jewelry are left behind. Blair died from a severe blow to the stomach. He also had a scratch across his forehead they think was from a crowbar. People said they heard a scream around 3.30 that morning, but that's it. This case is still unsolved. What the absolute fuck? Hello, true crimers. It is time for another episode of Still Unsolved Mystery. Oh, we're done with that. Okay. This is the case of William Peter Fisher. Viewer discretion is advised. This case first aired on an August 16th, 2002 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. It also appeared on an episode of America's Most Wanted. In 1986, 21-year-old Nancy Heyer was taking one of the trains in New York and she got lost. And just by chance, she ran into this fella, 19-year-old Billy Fisher. Billy, who was struggling with cystic fibrosis, took time out of his day to help Nancy get on the right train and get her to where she needed to go. And they became friends. Over the course of the next couple weeks, they became really good friends. Now, Billy was estranged from his father. This uh, bag of gray sawdust, William Fisher. 
You see, 15 years prior to this story, William Fisher, well, he went out to get milk, of course, and, and well, you know how it goes. He never saw the family again. Like I said earlier, Billy was battling cystic fibrosis, and it was becoming too much for him to handle. The medical bills were piling up. He needed help, and he knew his dad, who owned a car dealership, had some money. So he toughed it out, and he got a ride somehow to go see his father, who lived in Southampton, New York. The next day, and this is December of 1986, he calls Nancy and asks if she could pick him up from his father's place, and she agrees. But the next morning, Nancy isn't home. Her mother, Joan, called police and said, Listen, this is unusual. My daughter doesn't do this. But they said she's an adult, and this stuff happened, so there was nothing they could do. Her mother found William's phone number because Billy had given it to um, Nancy. So the mom called William, and William was like, yeah, they left after dinner, and that's it. I don't know where they are. She called back several more times, and every time she did, he grew increasingly pissed off at her. Something wasn't right. Well, about two weeks later, Nancy's car was found abandoned about two miles away from William Fisher's home. In the trunk were the bodies of Nancy Heyer and Billy Fisher. Billy had been shot 18 times. Nancy had been stabbed to death. William's neighbors claimed they saw him painting bedrooms in his house around the same time. Police got a warrant to search his house. They found two 22 caliber bullets in the wall with a little bit of Billy Fisher's hair on it. They also found the same blood type from both victims in William's vacuum cleaner. There was blood splattered along the hallway walls that was attempted to be cleaned up. So a warrant was put out for William Fisher's arrest, but he fled. His car was found abandoned at JFK Airport, and to this day, he has never been found. <sighs> this is you. This is what he would look like now. So. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the Blind River Murders. This was a story featured in a 1993 episode of Unsolved Mysteries, and I remember this one terrifying the living garbage out of me. June 27th, 1991. At a rest stop off a beaten path in Blind River, Ontario, Canada, Gordon McAllister and his wife Jackie were on a road trip in their RV. They had started their trip in Lindsay, Ontario. They had been driving for a while, so they wanted to call it a night, so they pulled off into the rest stop, and they noticed that they were the only ones who were there. Rolling over into the next day in the early, early morning hours of 12.55 a.m. on June 28th, Gordon and his wife Jackie were asleep in their RV, when all of a sudden, someone was pounding at the door. When the couple got up from the noise, they approached the door and the man could be heard screaming, This is the police! You need to move your RV. You cannot park here. When Jackie went to open the door to greet this man, he then pointed two guns at her. He then uttered the phrase, First, I'm going to rob you, and then I'm going to kill you. He demanded Jackie's jewelry. He demanded the wallets, Jackie's purse, anything of value. After they surrendered their valuables out of nowhere, the man then shoots Jackie and kills her instantly. Gordon manages to jump out of the RV and roll under it, avoiding the gunshots that were going his direction. Shortly after the commotion had ended, a 29-year-old man by the name of Brian Major pulled into the rest stop. This is when he saw the assailant, and Gordon can hear Brian say to the man, Do you need help? Before he noticed, he had two guns in his hands. Brian put his car into reverse and tried to flee, but it didn't work. The assailant fired shots into the car, killing Brian instantly. Gordon would survive the ordeal. He would give a description of the man, and this is a utterly terrifying computerized composite drawing of the assailant, who, to this very day in 2021, has still never been caught or identified. In 1999, uh, police would investigate Ronald West, another murderer who was actually at that point serving time for committing two other murders. At the time of the murders, he lived 12 miles away. He owned the types of guns that were used. He even used to be a police officer. The Blind River Killer identified himself as a cop. He even owned a blue van, which the Blind River Killer reportedly drove but no physical evidence connects him. Gordon died in 2014, and this case is still unsolved. 
Hello, true crimeers. It is time for another Still Unsolved Mysteries. And this is the bizarre case of Jack Wheeler. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, this case was actually featured on the new Unsolved Mysteries in Volume 2, Episode 1 on Netflix. Jack Wheeler was a Vietnam veteran who was one of the founders of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. He had previously served as an aide for President Reagan and for both President Bushes. He was also a senior planner for Amtrak, and he also worked for the Mitre Corporation. Now, John also battled depression and bipolar disorder, something he had struggled with for some time. On December 31st, 2010, at a landfill in the state of Delaware, the body of Jack Wheeler would be discovered. Now, he had been severely beaten. Now, the manner of his death was still ruled homicide, but something that Unsolved Mysteries left out is that Jack Wheeler actually died of a heart attack. But he was also physically assaulted and dumped. They believe he was initially dumped in a dumpster or something like this. The last couple of days of Jack Wheeler's life were certainly quite odd. Now, across the street from where Jack lived, there was a house that was being constructed. Jack opposed the construction of this house adamantly because he believed it was actually being built on private land and he called it a sacrilege that they were building anything there. He even filed a lawsuit against them. He was very vocal about this house being built and he wanted it to stop. On December 28, 2010, just a few days before his body was found, someone attempted to set the house on fire. They were unsuccessful, but left at the crime scene was this cell phone. Jack Wheeler's cell phone. But Jack Wheeler, at that point, was nowhere to be found. Adding more to the mystery, Jack Wheeler's house appeared to have been ransacked. Again, while he was supposedly not there. His kitchen had, like, chairs overturned. It was just a, in disarray. There was a footprint on the ground. Some people think that Jack Wheeler's bipolar disorder may have flared up, and he maybe did that to his own home. Possibly out of anger because he had just tried to burn down a house. The night before his body was found, Jack was seen at a parking garage and talking to an attendant there, but acting very erratically. He had on only one shoe. He told the attendant, I'm not drunk, even though the attendant didn't ask or even suggest anything. He was just seen pacing around in very odd ways. People described him as being just completely out of sorts. It was also freezing cold that night and he was walking around with no jacket. And then the next day his body is found beaten and police have literally no suspects even to this day. There was footage of some other mysterious people in the same area. It could have been a random mugging gone wrong, but he had on expensive jewelry, or was he killed because of the house? This is one of the strangest, and honestly, one of the creepiest, still unsolved mysteries that I've heard of. Hello, true crimeers. This is the still unsolved mystery of Charles Morgan. Viewer discretion is advised. This case originally aired on Unsolved Mysteries on February 7th, 1990. Charles lived here in Tucson, Arizona with his family. It's a... It's a place! Charles owned his own escrow company and he was very successful. On March 22nd, 1977, he would leave his home to drop his kids off at school. And then, poof, he was gone. Vanished. He went missing. But then three days later, he walks into his home. He's missing a shoe. He has a plastic handcuff around one of his ankles. His hands were tied together with zip ties. And he claims he couldn't speak because there was a poison administered to his throat that would either turn him insane or kill him. He asked his wife to not question anything because whoever did this to him is very dangerous. She nursed him back to health. He made her move his car out of view of the home so that they didn't know he was there. Charles would then claim he was a secret agent of the United States Department of the Treasury. He was also going toe-to-toe -to -toe with several organized crime groups. Back then in Arizona, it was kind of like a haven for that sort of thing. How Charles got involved with that, it's not really known. But it's widely suspected that Charles had gone too far into these groups. It's not known if he was working with them or working against them. It is confirmed that he had recently testified at a secret government trial. June 7th, 1977, about two months later, he's gone again. 
vanished, missing. This time, he would not come back. Eleven days after he disappeared, his body would be found in the San Juan Springs desert area of Arizona. He had been shot once through the back of the head with his own 357 Magnum. A part of one of his teeth was found wrapped in cloth inside his car. He also had a $2 bill strapped to the inside of his underwear. On it, he had written seven Spanish names, and he mentioned the Ecclesiastes a portion of the Bible. On the back, he drew a very basic map. Nine days after his disappearance, his wife got a phone call from an unknown woman who told her about Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8, which was then found written on the $2 bill. It's not known who this woman was. The authorities... They ruled his death a self-unaliving. Hmm. Did he do it himself? What about these criminal organizations? Did the government do it? Well, it's still unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. It's time for another still unsolved mystery. Stop it. This is the case of baby Christopher Abeda. Viewer discretion is advised. Christopher was born on November 28, 1985 to Bernice and Gil Abeta. They had already had six other children. A very busy family, of course, but they loved it. Bernice would describe Christopher as almost literally like a doll. He was super entertaining and he knew when people were laughing at him, so he would repeat the actions he was doing to make people laugh, even though he was just a baby. He loved getting attention. So, Gil and Bernice, they had a very rocky marriage. They kind of went back and forth. At one point, Gil moved out. But then, by the time the story begins, he was moving back in. As a matter of fact, he would move back in on July 14th, 1986. They were trying to, once again, reconcile their relationship. Shortly after the family had dinner on July 14th, 1986, they would put baby Christopher to bed in the crib that was right next to their bed. Sometime around 12.30 in the morning, he would wake up and Bernice would feed him his bottle and he went back to bed. They fell asleep literally within feet of the baby's crib. Now, they would leave the front door to their Colorado Springs, Colorado home unlocked because they had an older child who would be coming back home um, and it's made it easier to keep the door unlocked. This was also during a time where, you know, people were a little more trusting. At 6 o'clock in the morning on July 15th, 1986, they would wake up to discover that baby Christopher was no longer in his crib. He was nowhere in the house. He was nowhere just outside the house. Christopher was gone. They noticed the front door had been cracked open. They also noticed a window in the basement was open, which was closed the night before. No one heard anything happen in the middle of the night. No one saw anyone come in. He was immediately reported missing. Unfortunately though, there were like no clues left behind, no fingerprints, no fallen hairs, nothing. The police had nothing to go on, nothing to work with. The only thing they had a lead on was Gil's, he had like an affair before, and I guess she had a history of breaking into houses. So Gil and Bernice strongly suspected she was the one to do this, but police have never charged her with anything. As a matter of fact, she sued the family for slander, but the baby wasn't even at her home anyway. And that's literally it. I have nothing else to report on it. There has been no leads. A few men have come forward thinking they were him, but DNA ruled them all out. This is what he might have looked like over the years. Hello, true crimeers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. <sighs> viewer, viewer discretion is advised. This is the mystery of Catherine Corzelius. Her case aired on Unsolved Mysteries back on May 22nd, 1998. Catherine was born in 1989. And fun fact, her father, Paul, worked for John Bon Jovi. That's actually Catherine with John Bon Jovi in the background. Now, her family lived in Austin, Texas. On the afternoon of August 7th, 1996, Catherine, along with her brother Chris and their mother Nancy, were out running some errands. 
When they got back to their neighborhood, it was time to pick up the mail. And Catherine, she likes to get the mail herself and then walk back to the house. So Nancy dropped her off at the mailbox. So this is the neighborhood elder circle. So this is where the mailboxes were. Now, Catherine was supposed to walk from the mailboxes over to the Corzilius home. And then Nancy and Chris in the car would actually have to drive around this way. So they would have to go the longer way. Just a few minutes later, when Nancy and Chris got back in the house, Catherine still wasn't there. So Nancy asked Chris to go search this area to see if he could find her. He came back to the house in a panic, saying, Mom, I cannot find her. She's not at the mailboxes. She's nowhere. So Nancy and Chris get into their vehicle and begin driving around. Now, this image is pulled from the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. So this is a fictional recreation. Okay, this is not real. Lying in the middle of the road, flat on her stomach, was Catherine. She was breathing, so she was alive, and Nancy picked her up and brought her to the hospital immediately. Unfortunately, they would determine that Catherine was brain dead, and she died a few hours later. Initially, this was thought to be a hit-and-run driver, so someone ran into her, and then they just sped off. But... The coroner would say this was not a hit and run. She did have a head injury. She had abrasions on her left shoulder, her lower back, her right hip, and both her knees. He would say this appears to be someone who was either thrown from a vehicle, jumped out of a vehicle, or somehow just fell off of one. Scent dogs would pick up Catherine's scent in a vacant lot down here. And then the scent went away. This would tell people that Catherine may have been abducted and brought to the vacant lot, where she was then killed and then dumped. They also speculate that maybe Catherine grabbed onto the back of Nancy's car and she fell off. But to this day, there is no resolution. They don't know if this was murder or an accident. It's very odd. Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri is a fantastic movie, but did you know that it was inspired by a true crime? Hello, true crimers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. I'm gay. Oh, also, viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here is Kathy and Stephen Page of Veter, Texas. By 1991, they had been married for 13 years. They had two wonderful kids together. But by 1991, their marriage had essentially crumbled. Kathy was at a point where she was planning to file for divorce from Steve. Steve claims that they were actually trying to work it out. Kathy's family says no. As a matter of fact, Kathy already had a boyfriend who lived in Beaumont, Texas. In the early morning hours of May 14th, 1991, passerbys down this road in Texas would notice a car had driven into a ditch. So police were called. When police arrived, they noticed that there was someone in the driver's seat and she was dead. The body would be identified as 34-year-old Kathy Page. Now, at first glance, they're thinking, okay, she crashed her car and that caused her to die. The car, though, had no damage whatsoever. She had no cuts or bruises. She had drinks that were sitting on the front seat that hadn't even spilled or tipped over, suggesting that the car was gently placed there. She wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and she was found hunched backwards, not lunging towards the steering wheel like momentum would have taken her. This was a staged crime scene. The autopsy would show that her cause of death was strangulation. The coroner would also report that Kathy did have sexual intercourse the night of her murder. Around 11.15 the night before she was found, Kathy had dropped off the girls with Steve, and she went to go visit her boyfriend in Beaumont. By 4.15 the next morning, she was found dead in a ditch. Her boyfriend confirmed they did have sex that night. The coroner would determine that the male DNA that was found inside Kathy came from a man who had a vasectomy. Her boyfriend did not have one. Steve, he did. So Steve finally admitted that, okay, yeah, we had sex that night. Now, Kathy's family, and this is her father here, believe that after she went to the hotel, she came home, Steve wanted to have sex, but she said no. So that Steve then attacked her and sexually assaulted her and then strangled her to death. Kathy's family believes that the Vidor Police Department really just botched this whole thing. So her father started putting up small billboards. 
And then the billboards, they got bigger. <laughs> he even blatantly accused Steve. <laughs> Steve's parents are even close with the chief of police of Vidor. Now, Steve, of course, is saying, no, the police have been investigating me from the very beginning and they haven't looked at any other suspects. But the police have not investigated literally any other leads, to his credit. So the billboards are just as much for Steve as they are for the police. They're really calling them out and saying, hey, you need to do something about this. Our, our loved one was brutally murdered and no one seems to be doing anything. So Kathy's family finally filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Steve Page. Now, the first two trials for that ended in a mistrial, but the third one did not. They found that Steve Page was financially responsible for the death of Kathy Page, and he was ordered to pay $200,000 to her family. Now, Steve has tried to claim that the Beaumont Mafia is responsible for Kathy's death. But why? <laughs> he's even claiming that that mafia has threatened him directly, but he's not been able to provide any proof of that. So a couple other tidbits about this case that point to Steve's guilt. Kathy's mother uh, reports that Steve was seen vigorously cleaning his clothes the day of her murder. The day after her murder, Kathy's family says that Steve was cleaning the carpet, a very specific spot of the carpet in the house. Steve said, yes, I was doing that, but I spilled grease all over it. Now, there wasn't any blood found um, in, the, in the car. So, and she was strangled to death, so I'm not sure if there would have been any blood on the carpet. The family of Kathy also testified that Steve had on occasion abused Kathy. That's never been corroborated though. The autopsy would show that Kathy was likely strangled by someone with their left hand, and Steve, in fact, was left-handed. In 2018, the show Cold Justice covered this case, and they uncovered a new witness that said on the morning of Kathy's staged crime scene, someone saw Steve walking away from that very same ditch. The witness claims they did not come forward at the time because they were currently having an affair with someone and they could not have that brought out into the light. But even with all that evidence, the DA has still never filed charges against Steve Page. And to this very day, the murder of Kathy Page is still unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. I'm fat. How viewer discretion is advised. Now, the case I'm talking about today originally aired on season one, episode 15 of Unsolved Mysteries. This was 15-year-old Lori Zimmerman, and she lived in Hagerstown, Maryland. On the morning of April 6, 1984, her mother Sandra watched her get on the school bus to go to school. Lori spent the day at school, and then afterwards she went to her aunt's house. At some point that afternoon, she left her aunt's house, and then she never got home. That very same evening, her mother reported her missing and police began their investigation right away. They, of course, searched the aunt's neighborhood. They searched the school. They searched all around where she lived. There was no sign of her. Eight days later, in a forest off Reno Monument Road, her body would be found. She was discovered by two hikers and her body was first covered with two layers of cardboard boxes and then rocks on top of that. Essentially, it was basically calling attention to people. The 15-year-old girl had been beaten, she was strangled to death, and she had an object down her throat. There was some drag marks in the area, and there was also no blood found at the scene, so police believed that she had been killed somewhere else and then was just dumped there. But there ultimately was really no evidence left behind. You know, there was no fingerprints, obviously, because this is in the middle of the woods. At the time, they didn't really test so much for DNA on their clothing because DNA was still a very new thing. But they do still have all of those items, so they can test the items now for DNA, which I believe they were trying to do at some point recently. But police were at a loss because she had no enemies. There were no witnesses to see her be taken by someone or go with someone on her own. 
So police, kind of out of desperation, started to use a psychic by the name of Dorothy Allison. They gave her absolutely no details about the case, including the name of the victim. She was taken to the crime scene where she apparently named an exact suspect. Uh, but when police put that suspect's name in the system, nothing came up. She did accurately guess the victim's name, her cause of death. She said she saw in the vision that Lori did not want to do what her killer wanted her to do, so she screamed, and that's why he killed her. She said Lori was picked up near a library by an unknown man while she was walking home. She described it as like an old beat up yellow car. But despite all of that, it came to nothing. They have very little to go on, and sadly her case is still very much unsolved. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. Yay! Still unsolved mysteries. Viewer discretion is advised. The case I'll be talking about today originally aired on season eight, episode twenty-one of Unsolved Mysteries. Pictured here was Joe Cole. He was the son of Dennis Cole, who was an actor. Joe was also friends and roommates with an actor and musician by the name of Henry Rollins. He's the one pictured in back. Henry Rollins, this, this may jog your memory a little bit, but Henry Rollins almost didn't have a future in acting because he was also nearly killed during this case. On the evening of December 19th, 1991, Joe and Henry had attended a concert at a nearby nightclub. And this was in the West Hollywood area of, you know, Los Angeles, California. After the concert was over, they made a quick stop to the Mini Mart before getting back to the home they shared together. As they were approaching the front door, both men were accosted by two other individuals. Both Henry and Joe were forced to their knees and had guns pointed at them as these two men would begin rummaging through their pockets to steal whatever money they could. They only got about 50 bucks in cash, and apparently the two assailants weren't too happy with that. So they demanded that one of them go into the house and get whatever money they had in there and bring it out to them, and so Henry Rollins was the one to go inside. As Henry was walking into the home, for whatever random reason, one of the assailants put a bullet into the back of Joel Cole's head. He was killed instantly. There was nothing that happened to trigger this moment. They just did it. And then Henry began to run and the assailants began to fire at him. He was narrowly missed by a couple of bullets. The two men would then flee. Henry Rollins obviously was very shaken, but he was able to give them a composite drawing of one of the assailants. Both men were African-American males, possibly in their late 20s to mid 30s, meaning today they would be in their 40s or 50s. The man pictured here was 5 foot 11, 165 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. This was allegedly kind of a rough area of town, sort of like a higher crime rate area. The two of them had actually moved to that area because there was a high population of homeless Vietnam vets. And their plan was to help them, but also to film a documentary film about them. But obviously this never got to happen. Joe's father, Dennis, has since passed away. And despite the composite drawing, Joe Cole's killers have never been found. And this case is still very much unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. Do you have to pee pee? Do you have to poo poo? Do you have to pee pee? What the hell am I even doing anymore? The case I'm talking about today originally aired on season one, episode 19 of Unsolved Mysteries. This was 46 year old Perman Gilbert of Hammersville, Ohio. By all accounts, he was very happily married. They had four kids together. He worked as an appliance repairman. He and his family were avid churchgoers. Herman also had his own little plane that he loved to fly. He seemed to be a staple in the community. He was just a very respected guy and really no one could say anything bad about him. On the afternoon of May 23rd, 1982, a young boy was bringing his family's lawnmower back after doing some jobs around the neighborhood. When he passed by a ditch, he noticed a human body. The person had no clothing on. They were completely nude from top to bottom. 
he would run to call police, and when they got there, they would identify the man as the 46-year-old father of four, Herman Gilbert. His cause of death was a gunshot, but it also appeared that he had been beaten a lot. It was a vicious attack, and nobody could figure out why anyone would do this to this beloved man. Now, he left his home at 8.30 a.m. the day before on May 22nd, 1982. He was seen in various little cities throughout the area doing his repair work. And then at one point, he was seen at a grocery store in Maysville, Kentucky. He would then go into a flower shop that they knew him there, and he requested a certain employee because they knew what order he always liked to place. But then after he left that store sometime in the mid-afternoon, nobody would see him alive again. Perman would do his own repair work on the side on the weekends. So one of the theories was that perhaps maybe one of these clients was a woman he was maybe having an affair with. Maybe the husband or boyfriend found out and decided to react. Another theory was that at some point it's believed Perman was asked by a local drug dealer to use his plane for drug deals. Another theory is that Perman's brother Vernon, well, he apparently was going to be testifying against some organized crime, and his brother Perman, well, he was there along the way to help him out, so is it possible that one of these organized crime people got to him? All three of these theories are just that, theories. They are not grounded in confirmed reality. Perman's wallet and belt buckle are missing, they would look like this. His work van was found 22 miles away from where he was found, but his case is still very much unsolved. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. I want to eat a burger. I want to eat some french fries. I want to have a milkshake. I'll probably, I'll probably die from that. Um, a lot of trans fats and like heart failure and stuff. So, you know. <sighs> this is the case of Mark Grosinger. Viewer discretion is advised. This case originally aired on Season 3, Episode 11. By 1984, Mark was married to his wife Judy, and they lived in Golden, Colorado. Mark was 29 years old, and he was a concrete cutter. In the early morning hours of April 7, 1984, Mark was found in his vehicle shot to death. His vehicle was parked on Lookout Mountain, Mark was slumped over towards the passenger seat and he had been riddled with 38 caliber bullets. Judging by the gunshot wounds themselves, it appears that this person who shot him was at very close range. Now, they found shell casings all over the place and it indicated to them that the gun was reloaded at least one time. There was also a bag of unfired bullets on the uh, passenger side floor. Now, given the amount of shots that were fired and the fact that the gun was reloaded at least once, police determined that this was likely a crime of passion and not a robbery. Because in the car, they found Mark's wallet. It had cash. It had credit cards inside. They found other valuable items inside the car. The only thing that was missing were the car keys. Police, of course, would question his wife, Judy. She said the two of them had dinner around 6.30 p.m. the night before. They did so with a friend. She then says that they went to a liquor store, bought a bottle of whiskey, and then by 8 p.m., Mark dropped Judy and the friend off, I think, at the their home. The main problem with her story is that witnesses saw Mark's vehicle on the side of the road where it eventually was found. They saw it there at 8 p.m., and then the car was there still at 10 p.m. when they were going the other direction. Judy had purchased a 38 caliber revolver just a few days prior to this murder. She bought the gun with another man who was not Mark. They questioned the liquor store employees and they said no, and Judy never came in that night. They came in a couple of nights later. She was with another man again, obviously not Mark. Judy also tried to cash in on the $100,000 life insurance policy. And it turns out Judy had a special friend, a female special friend. Was she actually having an affair with a woman? Did Mark find out? Did Mark get mad? Did they have a fight that led to this? 
And more importantly, if she's having an affair with a woman who was the man that Judy was seen with on two different occasions, and by the way, the descriptions of that man were the same from both locations. It could be that maybe she hired this person to kill Mark, and that's why she was purchasing the gun with that person. But then that doesn't explain necessarily the crime scene of looking like a direct crime of passion. Because if this was like a hired hit, the person would have just shot a couple of times. The amount of bullets, again, indicates that the person who did it was someone who knew him very well and was very angry. Now, the woman that has appeared in Judy's life was questioned and police don't believe they had anything to do with this. Judy is considered a suspect in this case, but police just don't have any physical evidence to place her directly in the car that night. But they do have the fact that she lied about the time frames. She lied about going to the liquor store. The friend they were with that night, I guess, was questioned, but I think that's how they figured out that the time frames were off. The physical evidence they do have in the car does not point to a suspect either. It is entirely possible that Judy wanted the $100,000 life insurance policy and wanted to run away with this woman, who eventually she moved in with, by the way. But unfortunately, to this very day, the murder of Mark Grozinger is still very much unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. What should I have for dinner? I'm thinking maybe salad. I want to be less fat so that I don't die. <clears throat> this is the case of Jack Brown. Viewer discretion is advised. Jack Brown was a 47-year-old married man who lived in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Jack was a pillar of the community, he was known by many, and he was a successful real estate agent. On the morning of January 11th, 1984, at approximately 11.10 a.m., two men would walk into his real estate office where he was, as well as a few of his employees. Jack, who was on the phone with someone, could be heard telling that person on the phone, it looks like we have trouble. The two men walked directly to his office. One of them pulled out a gun and pointed it at Jack. The man said, and according to witnesses who were there, you think you're pretty clever, don't you? Jack allegedly responded with, well, maybe. And then the man with the gun just shot Jack several times until he was dead. The accomplice who was there with the man who did not pull out a gun, he then locked the remaining three employees inside of a closet, and then the two of them left the building. This is the composite drawings of the two men, according to the witnesses. Now, according to the people who witnessed all of this, this appeared to be very deliberate. They walked in, walked straight to Jack's office, and shot him. Almost as if this was a planned attack, and not some random thing. Also, nothing was stolen. Some called this that it appears to look like a hired hit. But why Jack? Like I said, Jack was a pillar of the community. He was not known to be involved in anything shady. The night before he was killed, Jack's brother had gone over to his office. Jack appeared to be talking to someone on the phone and he appeared to be very concerned. But when confronted, Jack said, it's nothing to worry about. Jack's wife, Anne, said that a couple of months prior, Jack had mentioned something about writing down the names of some very, very important people in the city. He then said he put that list of names inside a safety deposit box. When she told police, they could not find any record of the safety deposit box. The same day that this murder happened, a humongous drug bust was done. Police speculate that the timing, well, maybe this is related to that drug bust but they don't really have any actual evidence to connect it. And to this day, his murder is still unsolved. Perhaps you have the answers. Hello, true crimeers. This is a still unsolved mysteries that may actually be solved, but also it's not. You know what I mean? So this is the case of Terry McClure. Viewer discretion 
Terry McClure was born on February 23rd, 1920, and she spent most of her life living in Connecticut. But sometime around 1973 or so, she moved to the biggest little city in the world, Reno, Nevada. And at the time of the story, she was a cashier at Albertsons, just sort of doing like some part-time work for some extra money. Now, Terry had a son and a daughter, and on January 14th, 1983, her son Tim would get married in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Terry was 62 years old at the time, and she could not be any more happy for her son Tim. Now, to celebrate the wedding afterwards, they all went gambling at some local casinos there in Lake Tahoe. They had a rip-roaring fun time. And then when the night was over, Tim would walk Terry to her car, and he did so alone. And she said, I'm going to be driving back to Reno, which should have been like an hour drive. And then Tim, for the next two hours or so, was gambling by himself because he said his new wife was with her parents uh, gambling somewhere else. The problem, Terry, she never got home. At 6 o'clock the following day, Tim and his new wife were going to go drive to Reno to visit his mother. Shortly after 6 p.m. that night when they got there, no one answered the door. And her car wasn't in the driveway. This is very unusual. And then, on January 17th, 1983, Terry's car was found at the Carson City Nugget Casino. Terry was inside. She had two bullet holes in her body and she was deceased. It is believed that she was likely killed the night of that wedding. And this is about a half an hour or so away from Lake Tahoe. The keys were in the ignition. Her purse was gone, but she had expensive jewelry still on her person. Tim was considered a suspect from the get-go. One of the reasons why is because Terry had taken out a $10,000 life insurance policy um, about a month or so prior to this happening. The life insurance policy was to pay out Tim and his sister. So there's a financial motive, but he said, I would never kill my mother for money. I didn't kill her. He said that she picked up hitchhikers all the time. So the likely issue is that she picked up a stranger on the side of the road. They robbed her and killed her. There is a two hour window of time where Tim McClure was by himself after he claimed he set his mother off, you know, in her car which was around 10 p.m. that night. Police would give Tim and his new wife a polygraph test. Both of their tests showed that they were being deceptive. His new wife, she was deceptive on the question of, do you know who killed uh, your mother-in-law? In their investigation, police also discovered something incredibly suspicious. Tim had called to cancel his mother's credit cards not the day of her murder like he said he did. It was a few days prior to her being killed. Canceled all of her credit cards. The credit card companies confirmed when he made these calls. He told the credit card companies before she was even dead that his mother was dead. He says the employee was incorrect. They were mistaken. They heard me wrong. Police also found out that Tim... Before his mother's body was found, but after she went missing, he was out there searching for her along the highway. But specifically, he said he was looking for her purse. This is before anyone knew her purse was even going to be missing. This was before she was even found deceased. He said his new wife said, well, that's something that, you know, a killer may have left behind if she was killed. So maybe the she was robbed and killed and took the purse and dumped it. He also searched the parking lots of basically every casino in that surrounding area. There was only one casino he did not look at. The Carson City Nugget Casino, the where his mother was actually found. In September of 1992, Tim was actually arrested with and charged with the murder of his mother. But... The DA there in Nevada said, we don't have enough physical evidence to connect him to this. Certainly not to prosecute him. And his now new but now ex-wife uh, refused to testify against or for him, which caused problems for any prosecution. So, unfortunately, he was let go and he's never been charged since. Most of the family, his own family, believes he did it. But quite honestly, 
you will probably never, ever be held accountable for it. Is advised. The image you are seeing here is that of an unknown man who is connected, possibly, to a mysterious death in Tijuana, Mexico. And that death is a still unsolved mystery. I am still a gay guy, but I do not know how to dress myself. I need some help with fashion. <clears throat> this is the mysterious case of Patrick Kelly. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, Patrick Kelly was born into the Blood Indian tribe near Alberta, Canada. And at 18 months old, he was put up for adoption. And he was adopted by Terry, and she lives in Canada as well. Terry describes him as basically being a really creative young man as he was growing up. He really loved to not only tell stories, but he loved to write down stories. He loved art. It appeared to be clear to her that he, as long as he put his mind to it, could very much be involved in like you know, the art industry, the, the movie industry. And that's exactly where he was ending up. Patrick would end up going to the University of Southern California and he went to their film school. He was accepted into the film school in 1993 and then three years later in 1996, he had finally turned in this like massive project. He wrote a full length motion picture screenplay and he had turned it in and he was super excited about it. So on the evening of May 3rd, 1996, he had his friend Michael Park over to celebrate the big moment for him. I think Patrick and Michael were living in dorms there in the Los Angeles campus, but Michael says that around 3.45 a.m. he would leave Patrick's room to go to bed. He said that Patrick appeared to be in a really happy mood. He was excited. There was no indication that anything was wrong or amiss. But a few days later, when Patrick did not call his mother on that Sunday evening, and that was like basically a ritual they did every single Sunday night um, since he left for school, he would call her like clockwork, but he didn't do it this time. And that concerned her. She tried calling. He didn't answer the phone. So she reached out to Michael to see if he could go check on Patrick. And Michael would go into the room, the door was unlocked, and he said the room looked like, you know, Patrick had just stepped out for a moment. He noticed that his wallet was there, but his passport was gone. Um, and then his answering machine, if you can remember what those are. Well, when Michael pressed play, there were some concerning messages from some banks. So when Terry found out, she would call the bank to see what was going on. She found out that there were several ATM transactions that occurred in Tijuana, Mexico, um, that overdrew Patrick's account. The list of transactions would be as followed. On Saturday, May 4th, 1996, at 1024 AM, there was a $60 withdrawal from a 7-Eleven in San Clemente, California. 60 miles from where Patrick lived. At 6.08 p.m. that same day, another transaction was made in Tijuana, Mexico um, at a tourist place. That withdrawal was for $135. And then on May 5th, 1996, there were three more transactions from various ATMs in Tijuana. So Terry hired herself a private investigator because she had no idea where, where Patrick was. She hadn't heard from him. All these transactions are happening really far away from where he lived. And this private investigator, he found some surveillance footage. This is footage from May 4th, 1996, showing Patrick entering a 7-Eleven where he made one of his withdrawals. Now in these images, he was with another person. Patrick's the one in, the, in this image at a different location. Patrick's the one I believe in the darker shirt and the other individual he's here in the white sweater. And then this is a close-up of the individual that Patrick was with. Now, the two of them appeared to be moving around the store together. So they really appeared that they had been there together. This man has never been identified to this very day. I know it's super blurry. It's hard to tell, but maybe someone's memory can be jogged by taking a really close look at this face. 
So this private investigator now has found his way to just outside of Mexico where Patrick's vehicle was found left in a parking uh, lot, one of those paid parking lots. The car was covered in mud and dirt. The front bumper had damage to it. And then there was a cigarette in the ashtray and Patrick was not a smoker and he refused to let people smoke in his car. The driver's seat was pulled pretty closely to the wheel. Patrick was six foot one. He usually drove with the seat pressed all the way back. So it appears that Patrick was not the last person to be driving his own vehicle. The music, the radio station that kicked on once they turned the vehicle on, was a Spanish radio station, something Patrick would not have been able to understand. So the private investigator then started to disperse Patrick's photo around, and it finally led to something tragic. I obviously can't show the whole image because, you know, TikTok, but unfortunately they would find out that Patrick was in a morgue. He had spent uh, some time in basically a coma in a Tijuana hospital, and he died. This is what reportedly happened. At approximately 1 o'clock in the morning on May 5th, 1996, a individual on a motorcycle was driving. They were driving down the Avenida Internacional when apparently two people ran into the street and the motorcycle struck one of them. That individual was Patrick Kelly. For some reason, he was initially misidentified. This was of a man by the name of Luis Rodriguez. The authority said that Luis Rodriguez was 5'5". He was 27 years old. He was severely obese. He had on a blue t-shirt. He had on white sneakers. Patrick was 6'1", 200 pounds, not obese. He was wearing on a tan t-shirt and he had a pair of black Vans as his shoes. The authorities said, ah, just a simple mistake. Patrick essentially was uh, fatally injured, as it were. He had died six days later in the hospital. The Mexican authorities said this was just an accident, and that's it. Except Patrick didn't tell anyone he was going to Tijuana, and that's very unusual. Also, his debit card you know those transactions we were talking about that took place in Tijuana? Well, there were transactions that happened well after the accident, when Patrick was in a hospital bed, essentially in a coma. So people were accessing his bank account, essentially after he was dead. Also, his car? Someone paid $60 to pull the car off the lot on May 15th. This is after he died. And then the car was returned to the same lot. It seems like foul play was definitely involved, but they did not investigate it as that. Patrick had no reasons to be in Tijuana. He told no one. Even after this man's photo was shown on the news, on Unsolved Mysteries, this man has never come forward to say, oh yeah, that's me. So this man is definitely involved. Terry believes that somehow, some way. Patrick had gone to Tijuana with someone for unknown reasons. They were then probably kidnapped and then forced to give out their PIN numbers. And then they believe Patrick escaped. And as he tried to escape, one of the assailants got on their motorcycles to chase him. And they struck and basically killed him. And that's it. This is still very much unsolved. Hello, true Kramerers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. I'm on a booger diet. Yes, I'm eating boogers. So instead, it'll help me lose weight. But instead, I think it's making me sick. <clears throat> ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -bum. <clears throat> this is the still unsolved murder of Rhonda Hinson. Viewer discretion is advised. By December of 1981, Rhonda Hinson was freshly out of high school and she just got her very first job. She had gotten a clerical job at a nearby steel company in Valdez, North Carolina. On December 22nd, 1981, the company she worked for was having a Christmas party, something she would attend and was very excited about going to. Sometime around midnight, she would decide to leave the party and she had two of her co-workers with her, which she would first drop off at their homes, then go to her house. She dropped off her two friends, everything went fine. 
But then Rhonda never got home. A little after 1 a.m., Rhonda's vehicle was found on the side of the road. This is the actual photo. The driver's side door was open. The car was running. 19-year-old Rhonda Hinson was found lying on her back next to the car with her arms firmly against her side as if she was posed that way. She had one single gunshot wound that pierced through her heart. This is another crime scene photo. Right where those two arrows are pointing is actually where the bullet entered. So the bullet went through the trunk of the car. It would then go through the driver's seat and then out through her heart. A very unusual position for the shooter to have been to have shot her. Police, of course, suspect, well, this has to be a random act, right? Eh, not so fast. A couple of theories had come out. There was a possibility that perhaps Rhonda may have been having some kind of affair with her boss. It's reported that she had asked someone, is it wrong to do something like this with a married man? And her boss was a married man. But nothing in their investigation came from that. Because the boss was, in fact, at the party and was seen by a lot of people. Another promising rumor or tip is that possibly it could have been her ex-boyfriend, Greg. Now, it appeared that Rhonda's vehicle had been deliberately parked on the side of the road the way it was found. Greg himself was quoted as saying this, Rhonda would never stop her car in the middle of the night for anyone other than me, or possibly a dead animal, but that's it. Witnesses saw a blue vehicle that looked just like this parked on this overpass near where she was found. Greg had a friend who drove a vehicle that looked like this. Is it possible that Greg had rode with this friend and somehow managed to stop Rhonda on the road? Well, what would his motive be? Well, they had just broken up. But the boyfriend theory has also never been completely flushed out, and investigators say that they were investigating that lead. But so far, nothing publicly has come out about it. The fact of the matter is, Rhonda Henson was killed in a very unusual way. The positioning of the shooter had to have been kind of awkward, but also somewhat close by, because the bullet, I mean, just went through a whole bunch of things. So they believe that this was a relatively close shot that was fired. There is also speculation. Perhaps it was some sort of hunter, um, because there were hunters that, you know, were in that area always. Could this have been just a really tragic and very insane misfire? There were kids who had gotten into trouble before because they were shooting off guns um, in that area as well before. I've even read theories that somehow the police may have covered this up suggesting that the caliber of bullet did not match the type of weapon they claimed it would have been fired from, or vice versa. But really, everything that I'm basically saying now is really just rumor and speculation, because there is no answers here. The odds of this being an accidental shooting, probably pretty low. Considering the position of the vehicle, considering the angle of the shot, Considering the fact that Rhonda Hinson was clearly posed next to the car afterwards, this definitely was more than likely a murder. But who did it and why? In December of 2021, so not super long ago, police say they have reopened this investigation. I can't put phone numbers on the screen or in the comments these days because I get in trouble for it. So if you have any information about the murder of Rhonda Hinson, please contact the Valdez, North Carolina Police Department. Uh, just Google the phone number. It's pretty easy to find. If anyone out there can help solve her murder and give her family closure, you should do it. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another still unsolved mystery. Why do men have nipples? I'll never understand it. We don't even really use them. <clears throat> this is the case of Dick Hansen. Viewer discretion is advised. And this one's actually kind of creepy, at least to me. So Dick Hansen was from Sunnyvale, California, and he used to be like a big time college football player. But like it never translated to, you know, NFL or anything like that. 
after school. He had gotten married, and then some point in 1991, he got a divorce, and that kind of put him in like a, you know, just like a really negative mindset. So on the night of April 29th, 1991, he would go out with some friends to go have some drinks just to clear his mind. So at approximately 1.30 in the morning, Dick is with his friend Gene um, as Gene's driving him back to his car, which was parked at a restaurant they were at earlier. When they got parked in that parking lot, they noticed another car pull up just behind them. Headlights on and just someone sitting in the car and they weren't budging. So finally, Dick got into his car and then Gene was gonna follow him so that he could help guide her back to her home because she was unfamiliar with the area. This is a clip from the episode when it aired, but the moment they both left the parking lot, the unknown man also left and was basically following them. Jean caught on to it pretty quickly. Anytime she would move to another lane, that car would go move the lane as well. Every time they turned, he turned. She said there were times where they would, she would slam on her brakes to kind of like brake check them, and he would just stop right behind her and wait. So Gene managed to signal Dick that like, hey, you know, something's going on here. So Dick manages to pull off onto a road and Gene parks behind him. And then the creepy unknown man also parks behind them. Dick gets out of his car and approaches the man and he starts to have some kind of argument with them. Gene can't really hear what they're saying. All of a sudden, the man takes out a gun and fires two shots into Dick Hansen. Jean just kind of reacts, gets out of her car to see what happens, and she is confronted face to face with a man that she described that looked just like this. He stared at her for a couple of seconds, and then he got into his car and bolted. Unfortunately, by the time paramedics arrived, Dick Hansen was dead. Jean, and this is her pictured now, she had a San Francisco 49ers uh, license plate. So the speculation is that was there some sort of like rival fan who noticed because they were following her really and maybe they just really wanted to kill a 49ers fan that's just speculation but who this man is it's still not known and it's still unsolved